I'd like to start with the data we just got and, uh, and data we saw earlier this week in that uh, existing home sales are falling. Finally, prices fell uh, for existing home sales and for the median price. But we saw retail sales come in weak. We saw the ISMs come in weak. Uh, is the economy unfolding as you thought it would? Well, welcome, uh, Mike, to Kansas City. Yes, I think the economy is responding to uh, some of the forecast and some of the work that the Federal Reserve is doing to try to bring better balance between supply and demand. And of course, as rates have gone up, it always hits most directly, I think, real estate markets. And in particular, we've seen that in housing where mortgage rates have doubled. So these trends, um, I think, are to be expected in that sector in particular. Well, a lot of your colleagues uh, have said they're paying more attention to current rate measures than to the data that comes out in the CPI and PCE uh, price measures because it's lagged. Uh, why don't you just sort of ignore the idea of uh, the core rate? Because everybody comes out and says, well, inflation's too high. You look at the core rate. But you, you know that's uh, influenced by housing. And if you take that out, it seems inflation's coming down faster than you thought. I think it's encouraging to see, because we've seen this in the goods sector uh, of the economy. That inflation has been coming down. Um, I think when we look at the housing uh, component of that, we can see uh, toward this year, that should be, again, coming off some of its highs. I think right now, for me, the focus has really been on the services sector and the inflation pressures that we continue to see there. So the direction, I think, is a good one. Inflation is still well above the Fed's target, and so to be true to that price stability mandate, um, it looks like we'll have to be a little more patient to see uh, if we're on the right trend and going to be there more convincingly to that 2% target. Well, what would it take to convince you? So I think, again, looking to the component of the market right now where we continue to see a lot of pressure. Labor markets are very tight. I hear that uh, when I go around the region talking to our contacts there. So I think the pressures we see in the services sector look likely to continue. We know that spending is continuing. People are still traveling a lot and, and uh, taking advantage of that. So I think that would be a component where I'd want to see some progress uh, before having more confidence that we're seeing inflation come down. Fed was slow to see inflation rising as fast as it did. Uh, could you be too slow to see inflation falling? Do you think it uh, could fall faster than you anticipate? It's one of the things we have to be very mindful of. So there are lags with uh, this policy instrument. It transmits pretty quickly to financial conditions, and of course we've seen that. But we also know that there's uh, lag, so it's in the pipeline coming. It's one of the reasons that last month I supported that downshift to a 50 basis point increase because I think it will be important to begin to watch very carefully what signs are we seeing in the data, but also listening to our contacts in the region and understanding are we beginning to see uh, the kind of progress we need to see. Well, you had a reputation as an uber hawk, somebody who was always uh, very on top of inflation, and yet you were the first one to warn about the lags and the fact that the Fed had to be careful. Was that because of something you were hearing from your constituents out here? Well, in, in this most current tightening cycle, I think we were beginning to approach this at the same time that we were taking some dramatic moves to reduce the balance sheet. And so you want to make sure that as you start off on that uh, path of tightening, that you're communicating well and that you are not going to be more disruptive with that. I think we're in a good place today, again, being very clear about the commitment to getting back to 2%, some of this aggressive tightening. But we are reaching a point, I think, where it will be important to start looking around corners, listening more carefully for where some of those shifts are going to take place. Have you been surprised by the strength of the labor market and the fact that you've raised rates 450 basis points and the unemployment rates gone down so it is this is a very tight labor market and I think unusually so in this sense we've seen three and a half percent unemployment before 
But when we look at the people that are engaging in that workforce, we are still down in terms of participation compared to where we were in 2019. We see a number of job openings for every uh, available worker. And so in that sense, all the indicators show how tight the labor market is. And again, when I go out and talk to people, it's their number one concern, the ability to find people to come to work. So I think on the supply side of the economy, we're seeing some binding constraints there uh, that are, are making it more complicated, if you will, to see uh, inflation come down in a very convincing manner. Raise uh, unemployment by a full percentage point, and it's about a million and a half people who lose their jobs. Do you think there's a path to avoid that now? Do you think that maybe this is a different enough dynamic that unemployment doesn't have to rise significantly? I think when you look so far, so spending has held up. What I'd really be looking for is to see, are some of those job openings going to come down? Will we see some of those vacancies removed as we see this imbalance uh, begin to be addressed? So I think this scenario of can there be a soft landing is one we would all want to see, and there are some possibilities for that. There's still a lot of money sitting uh, in the, the checking accounts of households. They may hang on to that, that will make the job easier to the extent that moves out, that may create a more persistent need uh, to tighten. But I think you have to wait and see how that unfolds. Why do you think Wall Street doesn't believe you when you say you're going to hold rates for a long period and you're going to do whatever's necessary? Well, I don't know that I'm the right person to, to speak on behalf of Wall Street. I will tell you, uh, we can have different horizons and different uh, lenses through which we look at this issue. I hear a lot about recession probabilities, a lot of focus on what's going to be that peak rate. I think for me and my colleagues, the focus is really on getting back to price stability. And that is really a very singular focus right now. And thinking about what it takes to have that policy be sufficiently restrictive, not overly restrictive, to get to that point of a 2% long run inflation goal. Well, let's stipulate you do that. Uh, what do we see in the economy once this cycle is over? Do we go back to the new normal of low rates and low inflation? Do we go to uh, an old normal? Do we go to a new, new normal? What, do you, what kind of economy do you expect? I think it'll be different. I don't have that crystal ball to really see what will it be. But one of the things I think has been extraordinary to watch during this time, you had a lot of demand come in. So the support from uh, fiscal stimulus, from monetary policy produced a lot of demand. And yet we are looking at still pretty low growth. And we're looking at binding constraints on supply, and in particular, looking at uh, the labor market. And I think there, one of the things that will be interesting to watch unfold, I hope research continues to look at this, is we were focused for the last two decades, really, on is it a demand deficiency in our economy? I think this time, we've seen that there are some constraints on the supply side. And what structural, uh, the nature of those might be, I think, is going to be worth keeping an eye on. And I think longer term will have implications for monetary policy's role. How has the structure of your district's economy changed in your time at the Fed, and how does that affect monetary policy? Well, so many things have changed <laughs> over my time at the Fed. Um, still, this part of the country heavily focused on ag and energy. The ag sector, you've seen a lot of consolidation. Farms are bigger. The way they go about uh, doing their work is different. Uh, technology has played a different role. We see transportation and logistics in this part of the country, uh, very important factors in how we understand what's going on in the region. So I suspect many of those trends are going to continue. And as those structures in the economy change, of course, the Federal Reserve, as it carries out its mission, has to be uh, mindful of that. And we're well positioned to do that, both by boots on the ground as we talk to people as well as the team of people that do our research and think about what's going on. When you look at the world of politics, you see complaints uh, from places in the South and the Midwest that policymaking is decided on the coasts. And I'm wondering if uh, there's any kind of feeling that uh, the Kansas City district doesn't get represented, not, not by you, not well, but doesn't the, the, the feelings of people here aren't as reflected in monetary policy, on Wall Street, uh, in economic policy as other parts of the country. 
So it is true. You have you have an economy that um, has different aspects to it across the country. The coast, where urban areas versus rural. One of the things that I think is so important about the design of the Federal Reserve is that it does give line of sight to the policy deliberations uh, for people in the 10th Federal Reserve District. So you can go from Kansas all the way to the Rocky Mountain West and engage with people who understand their voice is heard. And those perspectives do go back to the FOMC when we talk about the nature of policy. So we don't have uh, the kind of surgical instruments that let us affect those. But I think being very open to understand that the different regions experience the economy differently, people uh, experience the economy differently, is important for people to have trust in the work that the Federal Reserve is doing. And I think that design is uh, so important to how that unfolds. You hear a lot from people on Wall Street, this Fed always gets things wrong. Uh, you've been with the Fed for a very long time, even uh, prior to becoming president of the Kansas City Fed. What do you think the biggest mistake in policy that uh, the Fed has made over those uh, decades that you've been here? Well, I'm sure people could point to a number of things. I think for me, Mike, when I look at the long-run focus of this institution, our mandate is one of long-run uh, decision-making, of deliberation around that, of ensuring stability in the economy. And I think those are hard uh, many times as the economy is shifting, as you see different business cycles come through, to get timed exactly right. One of the things I think, though, that the Federal Reserve is very committed to is learning from those experiences and learning what happened in that. Um, we've done that, for example, from the 2008 and 9 period when financial stability became such an important aspect of how the Federal Reserve would be able to achieve its mandates. And you see today a lot more attention on thinking about what role does financial stability play in terms of our ability to conduct the kind of monetary policy we need to. So I think those kinds of those kinds of attentions to past episodes are important. One uh, big issue in economics has been the treatment of women, and your bank is one of the best in terms of diversity uh, in the Federal Reserve system. Uh, is that a conscious effort? Is that because you're a woman? You think? I think it's a conscious effort. It's a conscious effort because, again, my own experiences are. The breadth of diversity that you bring to problem solving is so important. And that happens around the FOMC table. It happens in conferences. It happens here when we hire people to come to work and carry out the mission of the Fed. And I think the broader your lens, the more uh, you extend the opportunity for that talent to come in, whether it's at the Jackson Hole Symposium, whether it's at the FOMC table, uh, it begins to widen the perspectives that come to bear on some very important policy issues. And I've always thought that was important, and I think it will continue to be important for this institution. You mentioned the Jackson Hole Conference. This is Davos week, and the Davos Conference has changed tremendously over the years as TV has come in, as it's become a bigger and bigger thing. You let TV come to the Jackson Hole Conference. Are you worried that it takes over? I mean, a lot of people who are hoping to be invited want to know what the future of the conference is going to be like? Well, I think you know, Mike, we have been very uh, transparent about what goes on at Jackson Hole. That's been a commitment from the start. This is a conference that is focused on central bank issues where we bring academics, we bring policymakers from around the world to talk about those issues. So a commitment to being transparent has always been there. That's served us well. It informs the public about what goes on uh, at the conference. During the pandemic, of course, when we couldn't gather in person, uh, we began to find other ways to do it, as many organizations did, and created that opportunity uh, to do that. So we'll keep that commitment to transparency, I suspect, uh, for uh, Jackson Holes to come.